he speaks to us on the subject, what the Bible teaches, but most churches don't, Brother Ott. Good afternoon, everyone. This title that you see on the screen in front of you and in a different format on the notice board outside because it was too long may come across to you as a, an insult, uh, as arrogant, or as a surprise. But to those who read their Bibles regularly, it shouldn't come as a surprise because the clues are there in the New Testament especially that the time would come and would gradually develop that the Christianity preached in years to come would not be the same as the gospel that was preached by Jesus and the Apostles and that's what we attempt to prove this afternoon but also to indicate why it's important that we understand this and that we believe what is correct in other words, those things that Jesus and the Apostles did preach. You might say, well, uh, your truth is not my truth. It's a very common thought uh, the, these days that there is no such thing that you can define uh, as being true and infallible. Uh, something that you can't argue with, uh, but that is not the way in which the Bible presents the message of God to us, as we shall see. So what are these clues then? Well, let's begin with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who was early as that, before his death and his resurrection took place, we read, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now we can see without going into each word, uh, one by one, that the Lord Jesus was foretelling uh, that in time, falsehood would replace truth and that people would attempt to influence other people away uh, from the true teaching, very often to their own advantage. And the Apostle Paul then moving on from the Gospels to the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostle Paul said, of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So again, the Apostle Paul, inspired by God, uh, warned of the same thing that the Lord Jesus uh, spoke uh, of, that in, in time to come there would be changes in what was being taught. And then he wrote uh, in one of his letters to Timothy, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So again, in one of his letters this time, the Apostle Paul predicted, prophesied uh, the same thing, that the doctrine, the teaching uh, of the gospel uh, would change and people would turn away from the truth and uh, turn instead to things that were baseless, things which were fables. That, we would maintain, is the situation today, 2,000 years uh, after the Apostles died. That sound doctrine has been replaced by fables. That may, as I say, that may sound uh, arrogant, it may sound insulting to, believe who, to people who believe in the teaching of their <coughs> church, uh, but it's our endeavour this afternoon to prove uh, that that is the case. Another apostle, this one named Jude, or Judas, uh, exhorted his readers to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So you can see, you get the impression here, don't you, that what is to be prized 
and protected and believed are those things that were originally taught uh, in the first half of the first century. Now let's we'll examine some of these beliefs and teachings uh, one by one and in the middle of this talk we'll make some comments about the, uh, the reading, 1 Corinthians 15. So, we're going to be looking at the following questions. The return of Jesus to the earth in person. What is meant by the kingdom of God? What is believed, what should be believed about life after death? The question of baptism, who should it be for? What should it be practiced? Is it important? And uh, last but certainly not least, the question of the Bible itself. In other words, where do we get our beliefs from? So, the return of the Lord Jesus then was spoken of uh, in this way by the Lord Jesus. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. How can that mean anything than what it literally states? They shall see the Son of Man, which is the title of the Lord Jesus, coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And what does that remind you of? Well, the following words were spoken by the angels who spoke to the disciples of the Lord Jesus, who were there, present, eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus going to heaven. And the angel said, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Again, what, what can be clearer than that? Something goes up, something goes down. So the Lord Jesus ascending to heaven to be with his Father, following his resurrection. The angel says here that he will return in the same way. In other words, physically, literally, upwards, physically, literally, back again. Now this is a hymn, um, and you can read it for yourself. Come thou precious ransom, come, enter now my waiting heart, glorious King, and Lord most holy, dwell in me and ne'er depart. And at the end, when thou art my guest divine. So this is a modern hymn, written 2000, uh, I suppose 1900, if you want to be finicky uh, about it. This is the way in which the hymn writer views the question of the return of Jesus. He doesn't talk about a physical return of Jesus to the earth. He talks about some kind of metaphysical or um, figurative coming of the Lord Jesus uh, into somebody's heart. And that's a very common belief today and has replaced, by and large, uh, the belief that Jesus will return physically uh, to the earth. So enter my heart, dwell in me, uh, be my guest. You see how something um, literal, clearly understood, so now becomes something rather vague, which we shall see or suggest why uh, this is uh, in a moment. Now we talked about a general decline in the belief uh, of the gospel. Now we come to be more specific about the return of Jesus. So the Apostle Peter says, There shall come in the last day scoffers, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Now that, that's a prediction, isn't it, of what would happen. And uh, what we maintain is, that is what has happened. The return of Jesus physically to the earth, that belief has um, largely disappeared. You can't read this. I could provide copies for you. This is a list by a Christadelphian of the number of times in the New Testament uh, the return of Jesus is listed. And uh, there are, actually I can't read this myself, but I, excuse me, 334 times. The return of Jesus mentioned in the Bible, well in the New Testament even, 334 times, largely not believed today. The Apostle Paul again, writing this time to um, a community of believers at Thessalonica in Greece, said that uh, ye, because they were Gentiles, they were non-Jews by and large, 
said he, he said he returned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait to his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus so here were these early believers many of them converts uh, from the non-Jewish world they used to believe in idols now they believe in the return of God's son from heaven but today people claim to be, to be Christians to be followers of the Lord Jesus largely don't believe that and then the writer to the Hebrews says that he is uh, addressing those that look for him and no I've got that wrong uh, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation I mean, this is simple mathematics the Lord Jesus came once and he is going to come again he's going to come a second time so now we turn to the linked subject of the the kingdom of God in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel the king of Babylon uh, has a dream in which he sees a figure and an image looking something like the one on the screen which obviously is a, an artist's impression and to cut a long story short because this is a subject for another afternoon the, the prophet Daniel in, ex, in giving the explanation he'd received from God of this dream said referring to the, em, the time represented by the feet of this image said in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall last uh, stand for ever so this is a clear-cut explanation of what the kingdom of God means it's a kingdom that's on earth uh, it's uh, worldwide it replaces all existing kingdoms or nations and it will last forever and we have never experienced anything like this the United Nations are only united by their disagreements with each other nothing like we, what's on the screen has taken place yet this is this will be the kingdom of God now this is um, an explanation by a historian Edward Gibbon so we can't claim that he's inspired by God but it's very interesting to see what he has to say from a historical point of view so talking about the kingdom of God Christ's reign upon the earth he says it was at first treated as a profound allegory considered by degrees as a doubtful and useful opinion useless opinion and at length rejected as the absurd invention of heresy and fanaticism so this man then writing from a historical point of view describes how the teaching of Christ's reign upon the earth gradually became downgraded from uh, uh, literal to uh, nothing at all and it was dismissed and this probably would be because as the years rolled by Jesus Christ did not return to the earth and he is still not returned to the earth but that does not mean that he is not going to return uh, to the earth but as time went by this view was this belief was dismissed and as we've seen been replaced by a, a, a or we'll see replaced by a different idea so this is a website called learn religions and talking about Christianity and the view of the kingdom of God in particular the the author writes the kingdom of God is not primarily one of space as in the national kingdom but one of a kingly rule so this, this is the first point that's being uh, made the kingdom of God isn't like Britain or I should perhaps I should say um, the United Kingdom it's not um, a kingdom as we or a nation as we understand uh, the word but it exists here and now in the lives and hearts of the redeemed and we saw that didn't we about that hymn about the return of the Lord Jesus now saying 
in the 20th century, 21st century, that the return of Jesus is into our hearts. And so the kingdom of God, it says here, is largely believed now as existing uh, in, in our hearts. It's not a real country or a nation with rulers and territory and laws. You can see the view has changed. Now, this is another hymn, a church hymn. I don't know which church. Um, I'll read it. Come thou long expected Jesus, born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring. By thine own eternal spirit, rule in all our hearts alone. Son of God, so sweetly given, make our hearts your holy throne. Think, I did say originally the return of Jesus is linked to the kingdom of God, and indeed it is. Uh, so just as the return of Jesus uh, over the centuries has become spiritualized, if that's the right word, uh, so the same is true of the belief in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is now not something to look forward to when Jesus rules from Jerusalem over the earth, which is what the Bible teaches. It's now in the mind of the writer of this hymn and those who sing it, presumably, um, something that exists uh, in our hearts. It's invisible. Now, here is what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. I suppose one time, somebody standing here talking about the Lord's Prayer would have said, now as we all know, but of course the Lord's Prayer, along with a lot of other Bible Christian things, aren't taught very much in schools uh, today. But notice the wording. This is the way that the disciples were taught by Jesus to pray. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is something that the Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray for, God for God's kingdom to come, uh, in which, uh, or, and it will be, uh, take, and it will take place on the earth, and what's, the, what's involved with it? It's the concept that the, the world will be full of people wanting to do God's will. And in that way, in the earlier line, God's name will be hallowed. God's name will be uh, treated as holy. So that's what the, type, the disciples were taught by Jesus to pray for for God's kingdom to be set up on this earth. Now again linked to that is uh, belief in life after death. We know that there are many uh, beliefs throughout the world uh, concerning this matter. There are those who say, well, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what happens uh, when I die because uh, that will be the end of me uh, forever and ever. Uh, there are those who say, I can't believe that this is all that there is. There's got to be, not exactly a basis for belief, is it? But there's got to be something afterwards. Well, what does the Bible say? Here we have in the Old Testament, um, no less important than the New Testament, by the way, from the book of Ecclesiastes, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, uh, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. So what is this verse saying about death then? It's saying that death is non, non-existence. So we only get one shot at life, uh, do it now, make, make the most of it. But it's not saying that there is nothing afterwards. The words of the Lord Jesus, the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of evil, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation, or as we might say today, condemnation. What is the Lord Jesus teaching here then? He says there is a time coming. It's not now, but it's coming. An event will take place in which those who are in the graves will come out of their graves. So this is life after death. 
not instantaneously after death, but in a time to come that the Bible uh, calls the resurrection of the dead. And at that time, some will be given life and others will be condemned, explained elsewhere by uh, being returned to uh, the grave. Now, I, I haven't got a source for this, but I have read it somewhere. It's my fault that I haven't noted it down. This is an understanding then, of what Christians believe today about life after death. Christians believe there is an afterlife. Although the body dies and is buried or cremated, they believe that their unique soul lives on and is raised to new life by God. So this view is different then, isn't it? This is saying that at death, life goes on almost without a break. And this is by virtue of the fact that we have a soul uh, that is immortal and which continues after death. The body will deteriorate, corrupt, molder away, uh, but this soul uh, lives on. But that is not Bible teaching at all. It's, it's a very comforting thought, but it's not true. The Bible does offer a hope, as we have seen, but it's not the hope that is mentioned here. Now, one, of you, two, one or two of you might remember uh, this book, but probably not very many, because of its age. It was published in 1945, and it's called The Conversion of England. And it was a report produced by a committee of the Church of England who, uh, after the Second World War, wanted to fuel, wanted to uh, report how the church could refuel um, attendance at church, I suppose, and, and belief in uh, Christianity. But it says something quite remarkable. It says, the idea of the inherent indestructibility of the human soul or consciousness owes its origin to Greek not to Bible sources. Now that would be quite a, a shock to those who think that their belief that their soul lives on after death is derived from the Bible. It goes on. The central theme of the New Testament is eternal life, not for everybody or anybody, uh, but for believers in Christ as risen from the dead. I don't know what happened to this report, but I can only imagine it got shelved because it runs, on the subject at least, it runs right across uh, mainstream Christian teaching. The Apostle Paul, though, says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, which means the living, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So in a way, this sums up everything that we've seen. Uh, so far. The return of the Lord Jesus to the earth, he's going to judge the living and the dead who, who would have to be raised from the uh, graves at his appearing and his kingdom. So again, it, we're solidifying this, uh, this teaching uh, of the Bible about this event where the Lord Jesus comes to the earth to judge uh, the living and the dead, assess uh, in his mercy uh, suitability for uh, eternal uh, life and then to rule over the kingdom of God. Now, this follows on from what the Lord Jesus said, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. So this doesn't fit very easily does it, with this idea of going to heaven. I think there are some who say, well we go to heaven but then we come back again to earth. But that is not Bible teaching. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, we read in Revelation, and we shall reign on the earth. These, the, this book is a book of prophecy, and it's talking about, uh, in advance, about those who are granted eternal life on the earth, at Christ's coming, in the kingdom of God. And it says, and we shall reign on the earth. So again, this emphasis on the earth. Those that wait upon the Lord, says the psalmist, they shall inherit the earth, just as the Lord Jesus was to say uh, much later on. So let's open our Bibles now, and uh, we'll look at that reading that we had, 1 Corinthians chapter 15.
it's uh, an ironic thing and a sad thing, really, that when we read the New Testament, we, we see these warnings that we saw at the beginning coming true in, in the pages uh, of the Bible. And uh, the Apostle Paul in particular uh, is inspired by God to put pen to paper or whatever to uh, correct some of these false teachings that were coming in. And, and this chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, combines many of the things that we've looked at already. So he begins by uh, talking about the uh, resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Verse 4, he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So that's one reason then for believing the actual uh, bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus, which we haven't really touched on, but it's another thing which is an issue because of those who say Jesus didn't really rise from the dead because there is no such thing as the resurrection of the dead. He must have been asleep or he must have been uh, badly wounded and then revived, which is not at all the case when you read the whole of the Bible. And what the Apostle Paul here is saying uh, is that the scriptures, which at this time would have been the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophesied that the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, would rise uh, from the dead, which is a very good reason for reading the Old Testament. Then verse 5, he says, there are witnesses, and he names uh, two of them, and then mentions in verse 6, 500, and then he says there are others, um, at the end of verse 6, uh, who have now fallen asleep. Fallen asleep is a key word in this chapter. Um, and then he was seen by me, uh, verse 9. So he's building up this case that Jesus really did rise from the dead and was seen before he ascended to uh, heaven. Then verse 12, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen, and if Christ be not risen, then is your preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. So what he's saying is that our beliefs are centred on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from uh, the dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, it's all pointless. What we believe, what we preach is wrong, and therefore it's vain or uh, pointless. Verse 16, if the dead rise not, if there is no such thing as the resurrection of the dead. Of course, there were people in Old Testament days who rose from the dead. So there's no excuse not to believe in it. Um, if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And again, that phrase, fallen asleep, the Apostle Paul is inspired to use uh, to describe those who are uh, followers of the Lord Jesus but have died. They won't be in the grave forever, as we've seen. They will rise from the grave just as the Lord Jesus did. <coughs> the resurrection of the Lord Jesus is the pattern uh, for uh, those who have died in faith, as he says. Uh, they will come back to life when the Lord Jesus comes. So he says, verse 20, uh, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable or, or pitiful. In other words, if our beliefs are limited to the things of this life and we don't believe anything in that the Bible teaches about uh, a future, then we are pitiful. We're, or as we read here, we are miserable. So it goes on to say, um, verse 23, Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority uh, and uh, power. So then, in a few words, uh, 24 verses, we have 
almost a summary of the gospel. But how many people can you speak to who say, uh, yes, that is what I believe? So in summary of this section, Jesus' resurrection shows that our only hope of life after death is when he, Jesus, returns to the earth to set up the kingdom of God. So now we move on to another subject, apparently quite different, and that is the subject of baptism. The teaching of the Lord Jesus on this subject is quite clear. When he sent his apostles out to preach the gospel, he said to them, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not uh, shall be damned, again, or uh, condemned. It's difficult to use another form of words that stresses the importance, uh, the essentiality, if there is such a word, uh, of being baptized. And it's linked with belief, which does tend to rule out that baptism as its practice today uh, under the guise of the name christening. Again, this is the Apostle Peter uh, talking to the Jews in his day saying, repent and be baptized for the remission of your uh, sins. So we've got to be baptized, we've got to believe, we've got to repent, and then be baptized. As happened when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So now we add another factor, although it's implied in what's gone before. Um, that these are adults. You cannot believe, you cannot repent if you're a child. You've got to be of an age. Uh, you've got to be mature, shall we say, because we can't put an age on it. You've got to be mature enough to uh, believe the gospel uh, and to repent of a past life of sins before being baptized. This um, view though of baptism was uh, changed before long and uh, this gentleman Cyprian Bishop of Carthage um, said no one may be refused divine grace especially our children uh, who deserve our help and the divine mercy and uh, in these words he was advocating child we'll call it baptism and um, which conflicts with uh, Bible teaching uh, again. Now this is the, you, you may have come across this, I, I had some time ago, but it was brought to my attention. Christian Apologetics and Research uh, Ministry. They are adamant in their overall view that um, Christianity is, all, is really all about works and not, sorry, it's all about um, behaviour, I should say, and not about sacraments, as they would uh, put it. So they say, one of the most nagging Chris questions in Christianity is whether or not adult baptism is necessary for salvation. The answer is a simple no. Um, this picture is of a baptismal bath that was excavated in Ephesus. If you look at it, you can see uh, that it's, it's the length of uh, an adult and there are steps going down into the bath. So when this bath was being used, they were apparently following Bible teaching, which is exemplified by this description of a baptism in Acts chapter 8. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So baptism then requires going down into water uh, and being covered by it. It's a kind of death. And then coming out of the water is a kind of resurrection. And this is dealt with by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 when he says we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead we also should walk in newness of life. So Someone who wants to take this step then, who believes, repents, uh, goes down into 
the water, it's covered with the water in a kind of burial, and it comes out of the water a different person. Not really a different person, of course, but a person with a new outlook, hopefully for the rest of his or her life, just as Jesus rose from the dead. And so we come finally uh, to the first word in our title. And really it all begins here, although we're dealing with it last. Everything that's been said this afternoon is based on the belief that the Bible is the, is our found, is the foundation for, uh, or should be, for Christian belief. Uh, and that was the, te- the case in the First Testament, in the first century. Well, we can read in the New Testament that over and over again, the preachers uh, were quoting uh, what was the Bible in their time. But over the centuries, human beings have thought they know better. They know better than God. But originally, the Apostle Paul, for instance, said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, as indeed we sang in one of the hymns, um, men and women chosen by God delivered God's message. And they didn't say what they said because they thought it sounded nice or uh, it was a good idea or something they thought of the night before. They were inspired by God. In one form or another, they were told by God what to say and in this case, what to write. And again, the Apostle Peter says the same thing. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. It's on this basis, therefore, that Christadelphians base um, their beliefs. Now, this is not the case, though, uh, today. Um, The Bible is given a kind of superficial uh, respect, but many believe that they can take it or leave it. In other words, it's a bit like a menu. You choose this, you choose that, and you end up with a meal. But this is going to be a different meal to everybody else's. So there was this meeting, uh, which exemplifies this, uh, at Lambeth Palace, the Church of England meeting, um, about the vexed question of homosexuality in the Church of England. It didn't reach any agreement. And the Bishop of Stafford said afterwards, the debate is about whether we interpret the Bible literally or whether we look at its message for our own time and culture. That really is the question today. Do we take the Bible as it stands and think that its message is true for uh, all for our time, or whether we are able to tailor uh, the message? And in the, on the question of homosexuality, someone might say, "Well, that was that teaching was given years ago. It's Old Testament. We don't need that anymore. We're more enlightened uh, today. We understand." Uh, that your truth isn't my truth. We understand that the, the culture of our age makes homosexuality and, and other practices uh, acceptable, whereas they weren't in, in uh, years long ago. Uh, the Catholic Church t- takes a slightly different view. Um, and a conference in 2013 of Catholic bishops Uh, said, the Catholic Church does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the the Holy Scriptures alone. Jesus has given the Church the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for guidance in everything. In other words, if you're a Catholic, you you cannot accept just the Bible. You have to say what your church leaders say the Bible says, thus removing sort of individual uh, responsibility. But what does the Bible say? You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command. So, then this final note, which we leave you with, that we have to accept what was written originally, and said originally, uh, as the things that we believe today, however unpopular, 
and how, however different we should, we should accept that the Bible, the whole Bible and nothing but the Bible is the basis for what we believe and what we uh, practice. Thank you.